This is going to be a huge financial disruption going forward, and you know we're going we're going to get used to this reality. Well, you know you have this escape valve in Bitcoin, and that that the you know the worse the government performs with its currency, the better Bitcoin looks. That's just how it is. That's dope. This episode is sponsored by Vald and Vori. Please stay tuned for more information on both of these amazing companies later in the episode. I finally got the opportunity to interview a legend in the crypto space who I've been looking forward to speaking to for literally years. That man needs no introduction. It's Jimmy Song. Listen, we're sitting here at uh, Bitcoin 2022. Mm -hmm. You've been around a long time. I have. Would you ever envision 35, 40, 50,000 people in a convention center that takes an hour to walk across just for Bitcoin. Never would have imagined. But I'm not sure the numbers are that big, is it? Like 50,000 people? They, 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 they've said that at least that 35,000 tickets, I believe, have already been sold and they could, oh, wow. could extend. But even if it's even if it's 25 or 30, Yeah, that's the biggest matter? Bitcoin conference ever, right? Like, so that... That's uh, that's approaching like NBA like game numbers, right? Yeah, like we're that, Palooza here. Yeah, or it, it, it's <laughs> it's it's absolutely insane. So, yeah, I, I mean, I I don't know if I would have ever imagined this kind of thing for certain, but um, but yeah, it's uh, you know, I Bitcoin is inevitable. So at some point it was going to happen. So I'm glad it's now. Right, but so I guess then for you, like mm -hmm. you always envision the hockey stick. Yeah, well, not. Oh, Adoption, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's hockey stick or some other curve, but yeah, yeah, something like that. But it's happening fast. Uh, relatively speaking, on a on a year to year scale, you can always see sort of like the adoption taking place. Um, you know, it's maybe not as fast as what people expected, but you know, it, it is what it is, right? Like people can imagine a lot. So some people want it to go much faster than it, it actually does, and. It requires some patience and stuff like that. So, yeah. you know, it is what it is. But this, so you've been around basically since the beginning and you've seen sort of the evolution of every use case narrative, <laughs> mm. FUD, et cetera, et cetera. I never get to ask anyone this. Is there anything that's happening now that you actually don't like that's maybe bad for Bitcoin and not what you envisioned when you started? Well, the thing that's been bad for Bitcoin for many years is the altcoin narrative. It's, it, it's all Silicon, like... We get lumped into the same uh, industry as crypto or something like that, but the thing is, they they couldn't be more different. Bitcoin is actually decentralized. All coins are VC pumped all coin bags, right? Like they, these are uh, you know they're not adding anything, and there are ways for VCs to make a lot of money uh, very quickly by dumping on retail. That that's what's hurting Bitcoin. That that's a narrative that I think is horrible for everybody involved. Um, I mean, even the VCs, they're, they're getting used to, you know, six month timelines on where, where they can make like 7x their money or something like that. It's not good for them. It's, it's, it's going to blow up their funds. And there, there's so many of them that are going into this, FOMOing into this. We have like a VC, DeFi, NFT, all coin bubble that's going to pop at some point and it's going to be horribly destructive. And I don't think they really realize it. But that's, that's holding Bitcoin back. It's all of these stupid narratives that don't make any sense, but get pumped by VCs because they have, they're, they're basically burning their credibility for money. Right. So we have that problem on mm -hmm. one side, mm -hmm. but that also means we have a PR problem <laughs> because they really shouldn't have anything to do with one another. That's right. Right. So I always kind of joke, mm -hmm. I, I hate the term cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because most of them aren't even current, most mm -hmm. of them aren't even pretending to be currencies, anyways. Mm -hmm. And then, as you said, you sort of get them lumped together. What if mm -hmm. we had better p PR, so to speak, and people didn't even consider those assets mm -hmm. as the same asset class as Bitcoin? Yeah, uh, that would be wonderful. Except the VCs won't let that happen. The thing is, they they have a lot of the narrative, uh, and for good reason. They they they've uh, they know all of the media companies and everything like that. They they. They control the narrative from sort of technological standpoint because they've been known as the innovators of um, technology for a long time. For the last, what, like since 1980 or something like that, the uh, venture capital has been synonymous with like new and emerging technology. So when, when you have, uh, you know, all of that uh, like sort of stored up, um, I guess, credibility, 
you can you can pump these things and people will believe you. So you know, Andries and Horowitz or whoever, you know, they, they go to TechCrunch and say, oh, this, this is a cryptocurrency just like Bitcoin. I mean, who's going to go challenge that? TechCrunch isn't going to do that, right? Because they they're they're Silicon Valley funded. They they get all their stories from the VCs. They're not going to they're not going to contradict them because they don't want to piss them off. So uh, it, it is a PR problem, but it's one that's because of fiat money. It's it, it's based around this like. Uh, you know, VC industrial complex that that's all already built up. Um, you know, Bitcoin doesn't have a central committee that's that's right. like doing PR or whatever. <laughs> Call the marketing department. <laughs> I, we need better PR as a community. It wasn't saying that it's really yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. you, you really yeah. can't do it, yeah. right? And that that that's the real problem is that when you have all these narratives that are going uh, like from one side, and we don't really have uh, other than like Twitter or something like that. Uh, a way to push out like counter narratives saying, okay, these two things are different. Right. Like, that's not going to get to the public because, in a sense, like the public trusts the VCs because they're the sort of like the oracles of new technology incoming or something like that. Right. And until that credibility is burned up, which it will because of this stuff. Well. That it's it. We, we we can't fight them on the PR level just yet. Right. Well, I think uh, to a degree, people mm -hmm. trust the media, and the VCs <laughs> are the ones who have the key to the media, which means that the story is being told. Mm -hmm. But like Bitcoin, we sort mm -hmm. of live in a world now where everything's decentralizing mm -hmm. slowly, mm -hmm. too slowly. But people don't trust as much. Mm -hmm. Many people do, but don't trust as much what they're hearing from the mainstream media or the VCs. So don't you? kind of see at least maybe it's slow again mm -hmm. that we're trending in a direction where people are finding their news from their favorite podcaster or mm -hmm. their favorite which they have their own problems too but their mm -hmm. own youtube channel but basically have like opted out of whatever the mainstream is and are finding their own which we'll call alternative news sources which are just news sources mm -hmm. uh that they believe they can trust yeah i mean hopefully this is one right, of those news sources right, right. Right. Uh, but the the point is that when you when you have uh, control o over the narrative, or when you have the printing press, when you have this ability to print money, which all of these altcoins do, well, now now you could buy off all of these like you know, YouTube influencers or whatever, and most of them actually end up going and pumping some altcoin for money, right? Like this, this is the sort of incentive problem until these things all crash. It's it's continue. It's going to continue being a problem because. If you're a YouTube influencer that's like doing shows on, you know, Bitcoin and then, you know, some altcoin comes in and says, hey, we'll give you, you know, $50,000 to pump our coin for the next six months. Are you really going to say no? Right. Like you, you're you're making free money. So unless you have this conviction in Bitcoin and think of like taking money like that as highly immoral, which most of them, frankly, don't. They don't understand any of this stuff that well. Um, then you're you're going to come to a point where you're just going to take that money, and th this is a weird, like, very saddening s statistic. Non-technical people from in Bitcoin since like tw 2013, every single one has gone to some sort of altcoin, and that that tells you something. Right. I mean, the early community has basically just spread out into this tree to go. Yeah, be, to something. pump something because it, it's it's quick money. They think that they're geniuses for getting into Bitcoin early. Therefore, they're geniuses for getting into some other altcoin or something like that. Th this this has been the pattern, and until like uh, the gas runs out of this stuff, and it's really fueled by fiat money at the end of the day. Um, you know, it, it's it's going to be like that, and we're, we we need all of this stuff to sort of burn itself out, and then and then Bitcoin will like sort of rise from those ashes and and show people what the actual value is. Right. Let's eliminate the, the mm -hmm. VC the side the way that this is actually <laughs> happening, mm -hmm. but technologically, are there innovations in the mm -hmm. crypto blockchain space not on Bitcoin? that actually would have real value if this wasn't the structure of how they're being funded or... Merged. I don't think so, because most of them are highly dependent on the money printing that they, they're able to do. So a lot of DeFi protocols right, have some... Right, like, but removing the... Let's say they didn't even have a coin. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. so if, once you remove the coin, then no. Like, because uh, none, none of the economics work, none of the innovations work. They're all highly dependent on their coin continuing to rise in value. And th this is the problem with all of these things, is that... It's all fine and great until uh, uh, until it starts crashing. Then everything falls apart. It's a it's a house built up on cards. So, th this is the real problem: is 
you can, you, any business will work if you can print your own money, right? Uh, as soon as you can't print that money anymore, it, it stops working. And that, like, quote unquote, innovations of all of these things is, oh, we're gonna print money to do X, print money to do Y, or whatever. So, like, they're dependent on this base of, I get to print money. So, now, I, I really don't think there's any innovation there. I, I've been looking for one for like the last 11 years, and every single time, it's, you, you look at it and it's dependent on this money printing in order to subsidize you know, users using it for whatever use case that they purport it to be. And that's, that's ultimately what it is. But what about building the same, uh, basically technologies, but technology, mm -hmm. but with Bitcoin as the base layer? So like DeFi on Bitcoin, NFTs on Bitcoin, any of these things, I, right? I, like things like the metaverse, mm -hmm. crypto or not, are mm -hmm. inevitable, just as like the way that people are going to interact. It doesn't have to be on crypto. Yeah, well, I, 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 I don't think those all work, right? Because right. like, uh, they're, they're all centralized, and if you're going to do it centralized, then a blockchain is horribly expensive and stupid way to do it. Uh, if you centralize it and make it, uh, you know, it, it's centralized anyway, so if you really centralize it and put it on a single database, that's way, way easier. And it doesn't make any sense for anyone to add a blockchain to it because it just adds, a, you know, multiple layers of complexity, and it just... Uh, uh, you know, makes it much more difficult to do anything. So, like, you know, you have a centralized version and that's at least like a hundred times easier uh, in all sorts of ways. So, it, uh, I, I, don't, I don't see it, I just don't. Right, I mean like Visa and MasterCard are really fast. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, and, and they're really centralized. Bad, and, yeah. and, but, and that's and why. if you're already centralized, you might as well go all the way and like uh, get all the efficiencies of centralization rather than like the, this weird Rube Goldberg machine where you're paying the costs of decentralization but having all of the vulnerabilities of centralization. It's like, it, it's the worst of both worlds. It doesn't make any sense. I, Bitcoin, if any of them, mm -hmm. how do they scale to billions of people of adoption, right? Mm -hmm. To me, that's always the question is that we, with not with Bitcoin, the mm -hmm. others, we certainly see like breakdowns, mm -hmm. uh, time offline, whatever it is. And it seems to me that there's no solution, maybe layer two is whatever, mm -hmm. but there's no solution that gets you to this utopian world where three, four, five billion people are using these things on a daily basis. Yeah, well, I mean, for Ethereum and all that stuff, I mean, there, uh, the trend that we've been seeing is they just get more and more centralized in order to handle the scale. So uh, what they're doing is, uh, okay, we're going to move to ETH 2.0, and it's like ridiculous ideas from, uh, you know, like, like as a technical person, as a programmer, I would say these are like ideas that maybe new graduates from college think are brilliant or something like that. But any experienced software engineer is like, this is stupid. And you, you really need to have some real world experience, kid, before you design idiotic stuff like this. Um, yeah, you know, it's, you know, the, the, essentially that's what it is, right? Like if you're 2.0 or whatever. Right. It's, a, it, it's the... You know, mental masturbation of a night, like uh, uh, of a college graduate that you know has never had any real world experience. But yeah, the, uh, it, it gets just more centralized, and uh, you know, we we call these coins like decentralized in name only because they're using this arbit. They, they have to have decentralized in their name as a way to avoid regulation. That's that's the only re reason. If they were centralized, like they would be stopped by the SEC right away, but they have this arbitrage opportunity of pretending that they're decentralized so they can't get regulated. That's the fiction that they put out. Um, and they're, they're able to run all of these scams that would be illegal in any centralized context. But, do you, but okay, so then we obviously have Gary Gensler here who mm -hmm. clearly says Bitcoin's <laughs> decentralized. Uh -huh. It's not a security. Mm -hmm. Maybe ETH got through because it was kind of happening before him. But do you think that then we see him label effectively everything a security because of that very issue and we actually see a lot of it. I think it's inevitable. Yeah, I, I mean, we had the, um, what the Liberty Dollar and uh, and something like uh, and they operated for like 10 years, you know, uh, and uh, before the SEC really cracked down. Um, but if you have a centralized point of failure, you're going to get regulated at some point. It's just an inevitability. Um, so, you know, whether Gensler does it or somebody else does right. it, this is the big, uh, big deal about Bitcoin is that you don't have a single point of failure, so you can't regulate it. But 
all, all of these other things, they will get regulated at some point, and that's it. And that's, that, that's the inevitable conclusion that, uh, that these technologies have or these uh, scams have. Yeah. They're, they're going to get caught. It's, that's, that's just how it is. You, you talked about ETH 2.0. Mm -hmm. I think a majority of people just sort of accept it'll be successful. <laughs> it'll be great. It'll happen. It'll work. Right. Uh -huh. Obviously, uh -huh. nobody, nobody's looking at the code, like uh -huh. you said, yeah. right? Yeah. But what if it doesn't? Like I've heard people say maybe it forks. Maybe the merge just doesn't work. Maybe mm -hmm. we end up with multiple chains. I mean, how much risk is there that it's like technologically it just literally doesn't work? They yeah, don't make I, it, the it, transition. It's entirely possible. I'm sure they'll do hot fixes and hard forks every week until it does. I don't know. Maybe I, I, I have no idea like how um, audited the code is or how vulnerable it is, what bugs are in there. I, I mean, who knows? Um, I, I will say, though, that it's probably going to have some serious issues at some point because the computer science structures that they're trying to put out, again, they're designed by a know-nothing that you know, pretends he's some brilliant like genius. Um, it's not. It's it's the mental masturbation of a kid that took computers a couple of computer science classes that thinks he knows everything. I like. I've met those kids like coming out of school that think and then they uh, they get hard, slapped hard by reality and then they realize okay I, I need to change something. You know it hasn't really happened to some of these <laughs> people yet. So right. you know we'll see. Guys, I have a serious question for you. How much interest are you earning in your bank account? Is it 0.00001% or something similar? We all know by now that there's a better way in crypto, but you want to be using the best platform possible, and that is Vault. I have been using it myself now for quite a while, earning the highest interest rates in the industry. 12.68% on stable coins, 6.7% on ETH and Bitcoin, and earning yield on a ton of other assets. But it's so much more than that, guys. They have a robust exchange. You can swap your coins. And they have the amazing automatic investment plan where you can dollar cost average. Or more importantly, buy the dip automatically. We know that when the dip actually comes, nobody buys it because they're scared. Well, you can automate that process now with Vault. Guys, this platform is absolutely incredible. It does everything. They're backed by Pantera and Coinbase Ventures. You really can't ask for anything more. And if you use the link right down below, you get a 40% kickback on trading fees, 5% commission on interest payouts, and 5% commission on loan interest. Guys, sign up right now at the wolfofallstreets.info slash vault. That's V-A-U-L-D. Do it now, seriously. I'm currently wearing the most comfortable clothing on the planet. Are you? Unless you're wearing Vori, then your answer is obviously no. Guys, if you've listened to my live streams, then you've probably heard me rant and rave about this incredible company. We love them so much that we reached out and did a sponsorship deal after I've already been talking about them for months. Yes, it's athletic wear, but you can wear it almost anywhere, and it's the majority of my wardrobe. Seriously, I wear these clothes all the time. If they would make a tuxedo, I would have worn it to my wedding. And you can feel great about wearing these clothes as well because they're offsetting 100% of both their carbon and plastic footprint. Guys, wearing Vori is an investment in your happiness and your comfort. I am serious. These clothing are incredible. Get 20% off of your first purchase at Vori.com slash Melker. That's V-U-O-R-I dot com slash M-E-L-K-E-R. If you're not wearing these clothes yet, you need to go get them right now. Uh, listen, I asked you at the beginning, like, what is mm -hmm. the biggest problem that we have? And obviously, you said mm -hmm. that that's sort of it. Mm -hmm. What about central bank digital currencies? Yeah, that, <laughs> that's the wet dream of every, every uh, government, that's right? That's exactly <laughs> what I call it. I call it a central bank's wet dream. I love yeah, that. it really <laughs> is, <laughs> because they can cut out all of these banks. Um, and uh, the uh, banks from the middle and like have a direct relationship with every single person and uh, direct surveillance and everything else. Yeah, so I, I, I think it's a horrible thing and I think it'll be a, uh, a tool that will, that will be inevitably used by the state for nefarious purposes. Um, but at the same time, you know, like, we, we have this alternative. I think it'll turn more people towards Bitcoin. That's my question. So, you know, that, you know, 
the, with, with every good comes some uh, some bad. With every bad comes some good. So uh, sheep yeah. are going to sheep, right? I yeah. mean, there's a certain I hate to say it. There's a certain mm -hmm. percent of the population that's always going to behave in one manner. It's never going to change, anyways. I like to take the glass half mm -hmm. full approach <laughs> that you just did. Well, we've always had like a UX, UI, mm -hmm. and PR problem, sort of mm -hmm. as I said, right? It's just not that easy to use. It's mm -hmm. getting easier over time. But if your government mm -hmm. literally says this is how you use money now, uh -huh. it's digital. You put in an what address uh -huh. <laughs> and you send it back and forth. Oh, and by the way, now you have no privacy. That should be great for Bitcoin, right? Because now you've jumped the obstacle of people who didn't want to take the time to learn. Now they know how at least to digital, digitally transact. Mm. Like yeah. I know how to send you money now with mm. my phone. I mean, people have PayPal and Venmo, but so mm. maybe there is a. Maybe that actually increases the adoption curve. I think Bitcoin. eventually. I, I, I mean, like I said, I think Bitcoin is inevitable. And like the more sort of oppression comes into the current fiat monetary system uh, or, you know, to whatever, the more people will adopt it. Like the Canadian trucker thing was a huge boon it's for Bitcoin. Biggest. You know, like whenever you try to oppress or put more authoritarian controls on the fiat monetary system, more people are going to want to get out. And even in Russia and Ukraine, you see Bitcoin buying like crazy because people want to get out of that country and they want self-sovereignty over their own money. So all oppression is ultimately good for Bitcoin uh, because that's going to help people understand what the heck it is and what, why they need to get it. Um, and if you are in danger of getting canceled, hey, here's your currency. Yeah. Um, and the more the government cancels people, the more the government monetarily oppress people, it's great. Um, so CBDCs, while it's like, uh, you know, horrible for horrible. human rights in all sorts of ways, it's ultimately going to benefit Bitcoin because people are going to come to the realization. They're, in game theory, this is what you call like sort of the reaction, right? Like, um, okay, well, you do this, then I have this other move to counteract that. And that, that's ultimately what's going to happen. And people didn't have that move before. No, no, they didn't. Right, which is funny because uh, we get a lot of criticism of like the mm -hmm. way that the United States reacted to the 2008, 2009, mm -hmm. 2010 crisis, but there wasn't really another mm. asset class for people. I'm not saying they get let off the hook <laughs> by, by any stretch of that, but you touched on Canada, and I love what you mm -hmm. said because there's always this uh, it can't happen to me mentality, Yeah, certainly in places like here. Mm -hmm. That was the first time that it wasn't like, okay, yeah, but that's Venezuela, or yeah, that's Iran, or that's Lebanon, or uh -huh. whatever, that it was like, holy shit, it's Canada. <laughs> or even the U.S., where we got a 7.9% inflation print. I mean, like, Which we know is way higher. Yeah, well, and it's going it, to, the next the print's going to be, even, yeah, the, the, <laughs> well, it, the real, real inflation is actually monetary expansion, which is probably closer to 25, right? right. Um, but... You know, the actual, even the CPI inflation print is going to be probably, you know, eight, nine, maybe even 10%. I mean, we haven't seen these numbers since this, you know, early 80s, something like that. So we're, we're this, this is going to be a huge financial disruption going forward. And, you know, we're going we're gonna to get used to this reality. Well, you know, you have this escape valve in Bitcoin. And that, that the, you know, the worse the government performs with its currency, the better Bitcoin looks. That's just how it is. I mean, you say Bitcoin's inevitable. I think we yeah. all believe that. But, like, that's a great catchphrase. Uh -huh. What does that look like? Yeah, that's a great question. Like, what, once we have um, Bitcoin as sort of like the base layer currency, I, I, I think it fixes a whole lot of things because a lot of stuff is actually funded by fiat money, whether we recognize it or not. Like, you know, we, we get all these Uber rides for really cheap, right? Because yeah. it's fund, funded essentially by VC money. Where do the VCs get their money from their LPs? Where do the LPs get their money? Well, mostly because they're like cantillionaires or whatever. They, they get a lot of the monetary expansion routed to them. So they are able to use that money to as i mean vcs essentially have this like banking function right now they're they're the ones funding startups or whatever literally everything yeah so um you know like that that funding kind of goes away um i see it sort of like as bread and circuses right from the roman empire <laughs> like uh, uber sports whatever Gladiators, uh, man yeah it's 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 all sort of ways to keep us from recognizing our own plight or whatever once, once people start waking up, so, some of this fiat stuff actually like comes back to haunt them with huge inflation prints and everything else. It's I, I, I think it's inevitable that 
people will recognize Bitcoin for what it is and you know it'll change all of that stuff and we'll have to get used to paying for stuff right it's not going to be all <laughs> bread and circuses you don't get all of that for free so yeah but that's interesting because we land in utopia this <laughs> utopian sort of world but I hate to think about yeah, I, I the think path in between for your average person. Listen, mm -hmm. so like mm -hmm. it's it's interesting. You uh -huh. say like oppression is good for Bitcoin. Uh -huh. It is. Uh -huh. But God, it sucks to have to say that. Yeah. Because there are people who are being oppressed. <laughs> it is. Right. And so how much more oppression, how much more pain does there have to be to get to the point where there's recognition? Everything literally has to blow up almost. There's no soft path here. Well, it depends on how quickly people wake up. How much pain do you have to have on touching the hot soap before you stop touching it, right? And that's that's essentially, it, it comes down to whether or not people are, how committed they are to believing sort of like the current narrative. And the quicker they wake up out of it, the, the better you're off, right? Like we, we all say in Bitcoin, like you get in at the price you deserve. And, <laughs> and it, th this is the level of sort of like free inquiry and open-mindedness that you need to have in order to understand Bitcoin. If you're closed-minded, then yeah, sorry, you're going to suffer because of your closed-mindedness. Now, whether you see that as an actual vice or not, it is, and reality is going to slap you hard because of it. But I mean, yeah, you're going to suffer because of your vice, and that vice is following the orders of the authoritarians that are telling you these narratives. Yeah, and I think for those people, the really hard trap is like, even once you get it, mm -hmm. if, you have, if you're living literally paycheck to paycheck and penny to penny, you then it becomes this like out of reach solution that yeah. maybe is there because most people are not like, I got an extra 20 grand uh, for that in the Bitcoin. Well, so. it's not even 20 grand. I mean, like there, there are people, <laughs> yeah, I mean, people, you know, put away five bucks a week, right? Way back when. And they're fine now because, you know, they, they, they were able to save. And th this is the magic of saving in a currency that has an absolute supply. When you're saving in dollars, it's always sort of like you're, you're having to, play catch up with inflation and you, you you're not accruing value but if you are <laughs> but but if you're uh, accruing savings in bitcoin it works right like the that's the key um you're you're able to save money and it gives you motivation to save money and the you know we call bitcoin savings technology for that reason people don't have a good savings technology. And like the closest things that we have are real estate and stocks, and those are way asset inflated at the moment. So you, you have that extra tool, well, it, it makes all the difference. Once people wake up to it, now you're motivated. You know, I, I was ta talking to people uh, about this, a lot of people that live paycheck to paycheck are starting to accumulate Bitcoin. Yeah. And it's like, okay, yeah, that's the mentality shift that you need to have. That's what it means to wake up. So, you know, even if you're living paycheck to paycheck, maybe you don't buy that latte and save the five bucks and buy, buy Bitcoin. Those things make a difference. Uh, uh, in a fiat world, it's all YOLO and FOMO and like live for tomorrow. That's what we call high time preference behavior. Low time preference behavior is all a part of that Bitcoin mentality. Right. I mean, people have, they've been saving the wrong asset, mm -hmm. but people have been told to save mm -hmm. their whole lives. It's possible. They say even if it's a buck, <laughs> uh -huh. or three bucks, or four bucks, or five bucks, it will make a meaningful difference. Absolutely, and I, I think this is what it means to wake up. And I, I, people will wake up to it at some point. And it, I, it, it's not a short-term fix, right? It's, it's something that you have to be in for many years in order to really get. Um, but that, that's what it's gonna require because you know, it's, it's very difficult to understand uh, this whole system and like people want quick solutions. This is a low well, time get preference thing. Yeah. Get, get, get rich quick scheme. It, it's not. It's, it's a five year thing. Right, but talking about that, right? So <laughs> it was always like short the bankers, long uh -huh. Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. But now we have this sort of cognitive dissonance uh -huh. where like the Bitcoin community cheers institutions, uh -huh. VCs, Wall Street, hedge mm -hmm. funds coming in because number go up, right? It, Partly, supplies, I mean, supply I, reduces. <laughs> right, but so should we be. Is it for every man? Is it for institutions? Is it literally for everyone? Or is there actually harm being done by the institutional narrative to... It's the money of enemies, right? So you can't, you can't control who goes and buys it. And if institutions want to buy it, they can. Should we cheer it? I don't know. 
I mean, in, in a sense, they're capitulating to the Bitcoin narrative every time they buy it. But they're also going to sell at the first sign of trouble. Possibly, possibly not, yeah. right? Uh, it depends not. on <laughs> uh, yeah. It depends on your uh, time preference, and you know, it's it's like any person or whatever. So. I don't know. I don't know uh, like how beneficial it is, how harmful it is, or whatever. Um, I just know that it's the money of enemies, and you know, at, at some point it'll be they'll, they'll they won't be selling. They'll they'll be holding. Yeah. Um, and for those institutions that you know, I mean, again, everyone gets in at the price they deserve. I love that. <laughs> And if they got in at an early time or a late time or whatever, they got in at the price they deserve. That's when they woke up. So, yeah. you know, uh, good luck to them. But, you know, it, it doesn't really matter to me. I mean, we're still small anyway, so yeah. maybe it's just all hands on deck. <laughs> yeah, possibly, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing watching, like, people that were absolutely, like, hated by the community and they, yeah. like, buy one Bitcoin and all of a sudden they're like, <laughs> hero. <laughs> well, we try to be welcoming in this yeah, community. It's, it's, right? it's <laughs> like, you change your mind, great. That's awesome. Um, instead of, hey, you're our enemy forever. So, yeah. yeah. That's good. Strong yeah. opinions loosely held. Like people are allowed to change their minds and, 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 and wake up. Yeah. I think it's just important for people to realize like Bitcoin doesn't give a shit either way. Yeah. It's totally agnostic. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter who's using it. The, the, like I, I love what like the Elizabeth Warren, the sanctions, right? And like we should ban it. It's to me that's like saying that there's someone spreading fake news on the internet. Mm. Let's ban the internet. Yeah. Like not worry about the person who's doing it or the activity. Let's ban the layer in between. It's so stupid. Well, a regulator is going to regulate, right? Uh, they and they, 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 they only have a hammer and they see everything as a nail. It, uh, Bitcoin's not a nail. That's that's the thing. Uh, and uh, she she does what she does because she has a very safe seat in Massachusetts. I mean, the two sen Democratic senators before her, like I, I, John Kerry, was the junior senator from Massachusetts for like thirty years, right? Like. That tells you like how safe. <laughs> that, that, that's how safe her seat is. So she can go afford to go say that. But you know, you're a Democrat in a you know toss up race like Ohio. You can't really say that anymore. So, do you think that we're actually seeing? I, I like to think so. No? But do you think that now the community is large enough mm -hmm. that it's like a little a literal political risk to be on the wrong side and that you whether you actually care about I, I, I don't take the positive view of them mm -hmm. I think they're just trying to keep their jobs mm -hmm. but they have to have an opinion and now it has to be the right one or they can literally get voted out can Absolutely. we be a strong enough blo voting block immediately we have a midterm election coming up in a few months mm -hmm. like do you think that the Bitcoin community actually has enough power now to decide who well, so I think the latest stats I heard were from Grayscale, something like 23 million Americans have some exposure to Bitcoin. Oh, Bitcoin, and even and yeah, crypto oh, in general think, is like 65, 60 yeah, yeah, something. Yeah, some, some, some much larger number. So, I mean, ARP is about 40 million, you know, and they're the strongest lobby in D.C. pretty much. So, yeah. I mean, we're up there. And, and th this is what all the politicians are scared of. And... Yeah, you look at like an, uh, the Senate race in Ohio, for instance. You got three Republicans, two Democrats. You know, these are the top five people for that race. All of them are saying good things about Bitcoin. You have to. Do you have to? Because uh, that's a that's a significant part of your electorate, and you know, like twenty thousand votes means a lot in those th places. Yeah. And you're you're looking at much larger numbers, especially if you look at like the single issue voter and stuff. So it's. It, yeah, it, it's gonna matter, and uh, and you know it's only gonna matter more. And in a sense, that the Bitcoin voter is going to be a huge constituency. You know, I, obviously, yeah. I wrote a book about this, yeah. right? <laughs> the Bitcoin and the American yeah. Dream. So, it it Bitcoin is going to be a much bigger part of the political conversation going forward. That's just true. The Gemini's report just said that of all of those people holding it, forty five percent bought it for the first time in 2021. That's insane. Well, I mean, it kind of makes sense because of all the inflation going on. But yeah, I mean, we're, we're going to see more adoption every time. But yeah. that that's the hockey. I mean, that's yeah. crazy. Mm -hmm. But that just it shows us how absolutely early we are. Mm. So absolutely. after this conversation, where can everybody uh, keep up with you and follow you? Well, so my Twitter is at Jimmy Song. My website is programmingbitcoin.com. And uh, you can sign up for my newsletter, jimmysong.substack.com. Well, hopefully uh, we'll be having this conversation another year or two down the road and we'll have 10 more years or 20 years ahead on the adoption curve. Well, let's hope so. Hopefully they don't have so many NFT things here. But. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, uh, they're skirting it very carefully. Yeah, Even on stage, trying. it's really funny to see that you're not allowed to say it. 
but they can dance I, I around I really it. hope like the people here like start booing whenever anyone mentions crypto or NFT or something. Just like I, I want the crowd to just go boo. We need a we need a new name than crypto. Yeah. Bottom line. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just Bitcoin and everything else. It's yeah. Bitcoin and scam coin. That's what yeah. we should call it. Yeah. I like it. All Thank right. you, man. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you haven't already left a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please do that now. Spotify just added ratings, so please go ahead and click that five star. I'll see you guys next time. Mm -hmm.